James continues, Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast and be false to the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Let's pray together. Father, by your word and now by your spirit, As we look at this text together, God, grow us in wisdom. All of us who were unwise in our sin, God, grow our wisdom in Christ. That we might, in the meekness of our wisdom, do good works that would glorify you, our Father in heaven. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Baxter. Max Born. Max Born. He's one of the smartest men of the 20th century. He won the Nobel Prize in physics in 1954 for his work in quantum theory. He was a a close friend of Albert Einstein. Just before he died in 1970, he was quoted as saying, I would be happier if we had scientists with less brains and more wisdom. Sometimes we forget that knowledge and wisdom are not the same thing. Last last time, last week, we, we saw that James warned his listeners of the incredible damage that the tongue can do. And now we find that he taught them about wisdom. And he taught them and he's teaching us there is a a great deal of difference between between human wisdom and godly wisdom, between earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom. So what can we learn about wisdom in our time together this morning? We're going to look at, at the difference between worldly wisdom and heavenly wisdom in our time together this morning. First, let's look at worldly wisdom. James 3, 13 through 16 Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and Every evil thing are there. Wisdom, this is your outline, wisdom is one of the key themes in the book of James. In fact, James is oftentimes referred to as the Proverbs of the New Testament or the wisdom writings of the New Testament. James chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, where James introduces this theme that he's, that he's unpacking here in this passage. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. So James said, wisdom is ours for the asking, but we have to ask in faith. And here James implies, how can we tell if someone is really wise? How can we tell? How can we identify wisdom? And and the answer is, just watch. And as we saw last week, listen. Just watch and listen. Just watch, watch one another. Watch me as I live my life. Watch as as others live their lives and you'll see wisdom or the lack thereof. 
Last week we saw that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Matthew 1, 2, 3, 4. Matthew 12, 34. It's one of those verses that we need to commit to memory. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And now we find that James seems to be saying, words aren't enough. Words aren't enough. Wisdom is revealed by the way that we live our lives. If you were here when we, when we looked at James 1, 5, and 6, you'll remember, or hopefully you'll remember, or I'm about to remind you, that the definition of wisdom is skilled living. That's what wisdom means. It means skilled living. Wisdom is not measured in diplomas or by degrees. You can't get it by going to school. Wisdom is not just knowing the truth. Wisdom is doing the truth. Wisdom is measured by the way we live our lives. And the Bible says it begins with a healthy fear of the Lord. A reverence for the Lord. Proverbs 9 and verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Now wisdom can be learned. It's not something we're necessarily born with. We're not born wise. It's something we learn. But it can be learned in a textbook. It's learned from the good book. It's learned from the Bible. We learn wisdom, listen, we learn wisdom when we trust God and love people. You've heard this before. We might not know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. That's a wise statement. That's a wise saying. We may not know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. We prove our wisdom by what we do and sometimes by what we restrain ourselves from doing. Wisdom is knowing and doing God's will. But James tells us not all wisdom is godly wisdom. James says if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie about the truth. This wisdom is not or, or does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion, confusion and every evil thing are there. Worldly wisdom is nothing like heavenly wisdom. It's on the opposite end of the spectrum. James said worldly wisdom is demonic. Those are pretty powerful words. Worldly wisdom is demonic. When we speak of the world or the world system, we're talking about the demonic. Worldly wisdom evaluates everything according to the world's standards. It makes personal gain a person's highest goal. Listen, the world's definition of success and God's definition of success are two entirely different things. Sometimes we catch ourselves saying, oh, she's a very successful woman or he's a very successful man, and we have no idea what we're talking about. Sometimes we choose the wrong language. Worldly success and godly success are two totally different things. In short, worldly wisdom is rooted in selfishness. And selfishness is not compatible with godliness. Well, secondly, there's heavenly wisdom. Look at verses 17 and 18. But the wisdom that is found from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. So where worldly wisdom is, is envious and selfish and, and James says even demonic, 
Heavenly wisdom is pure, peaceable, gentle, giving, merciful, fruitful, non-discriminating, and genuine, authentic. And we recognize godly wisdom in someone by the way they make peace with God and with others. Where worldly wisdom seeks itself at any cost, heavenly wisdom seeks peace. Heavenly wisdom seeks to be peaceable with God and with others. So the key to heavenly wisdom is peace. The key to heavenly wisdom is peace. This word for peaceable is truly one of the great words of the Bible. In the Septuagint, that is the Greek version of the Old Testament, it's often used to describe God as king. And it doesn't mean peaceable as simply the opposite of conflict or the opposite of war. It means peaceable as it relates to discipline. This word is referring to discipline in our lives. The greatest power is the ability to yield power, but have the self-discipline to control it. That's wisdom. Kim Jong-un, we've all, we're all familiar with him. We've been hearing about him and watching him on the news. We know who he is. You know he's 33 years old. He's a very young man. He's 33 years old. And he has the power to take someone's life just by saying the word. Or maybe just giving a certain look. Not just one person's life. He has the power to take hundreds or thousands of people's lives just by saying the word. But a wise king has the discipline to control that power. So, Lil Kim is a picture of an unwise man. He's a picture in our very world right now of someone who is, who is very unwise because he can't seem to control that power. A wise king loves peace and not violence. A wise king is peaceable. God is a wise king. He's disciplined and self-controlled. Think about Jesus hanging on the cross. He could have come down. He could have destroyed all the Romans. He could have ended it right then and right there. But God is disciplined. In self-control, and that's why the spiritual disciplines are so important for Christians to, to practice and to study. God is peaceable, and God is love. Jesus Christ is the Prince of Peace, and He came to make peace between God and us. In fact, Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And we say, well, how do I get there? How do I get that? I want that. I want to be wise. I want godly wisdom in my life. But we submit our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It's really a very simple answer. Very simple. We submit our lives to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Again, James 1, 5, and 6. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. And then James said in 1, But be doers of the word. Not hearers only, deceiving yourself. So wise people are doers of the word. Not hearers only. Wise people do what God calls us to do in His word. We're doers of the word. So the difference between 
earthly wisdom and heavenly wisdom can really be summed up in one word. Peace. Where worldly wisdom seeks itself at any cost, heavenly wisdom seeks peace. Even sometimes at the expense of itself. So, we need someone to show us how to live wise lives. We have to have, we have, to have someone to show us in the flesh. We have to have someone to set the example and show us how to live the Christian life, and that's why God calls out pastors and deacons. Pastors and deacons are set aside, ordained. That means we're set aside for the service of the Lord. It means that God has called us out to be an example. First and foremost, to be an example of what a Christian looks like, how a Christian lives. We're to be an example. Listen, if pastors and deacons and ministerial staff, listen, if we're not regular in Bible study and prayer, and, and if we're not soul winning, if we're not, if we're not steady in Sunday school and worship ex service experience, think about it. Why should any of us, why should any of us do it? We need leaders. We need leaders in our churches. And if leaders aren't leading, then why should we expect success? And ordained men are set aside to lead. To lead by example. We're going to ordain two men to deacon ministry here at Northgate in just a few moments. Now understand, I've already talked to these guys. Ordination is for a lifetime. There'll never be a time when these guys are unordained. They will be ordained from this day forward. I'll never forget the day I was ordained as a deacon. I'll never forget that day. I'm, I'm a deacon. I was set aside. And on that day, the bar was raised in my life. And today, the bar is going to be raised in Chad's life and in Wayne's life, and it will never be lowered. The bar is raised, and it will never be lowered. Because, listen, someone must walk point. Someone's got to lead. So God calls us out, and He sets us aside for that purpose. Ordained men of God set the example for us to live godly lives. We deny ourselves. We take up our cross, and we follow Jesus. Chad and Wayne are about to be ordained to deacon ministry. And this passage is so timely. It's so fitting. You see, deacon ministry requires a knowledge of the church and her members and her ministry. But far more than that, it requires wisdom. It requires wisdom. And, and Wisdom is, be, is to be doers of the word, not hearers only. And someone, somebody, has to show us how to do that. And that's why we set men aside to be leaders. That's what ordination is about. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you in the name of the Lord Jesus. We confess right now, Lord, that, that we all fall short. That we all stand in need of your forgiveness.
Yet we need leaders. We need ordained men of God who are unafraid to follow Jesus without excuse, to set the example. So, Father, we pray for all of our deacons today, whether they are, as we would say in human speech, active or inactive. Lord, you don't see it that way because there's never a time when we're not ordained once we've been ordained. So, Father, we pray ask your blessings and today we celebrate this ordination. But Father, the greatest need today is, is our relationship with you. No doubting, as you say in your word. For we pray this and we pray all.